everything that we do from our customer evaluations to the technology that we build to the roadmaps that we have everything converges with one thing in mind and that's to serve you the customer sharewell provides enterprise power without the, the cost and complexity i've got a system that i can customize with little training never have to write a line of code and never need a developer level resource to touch the tool having this portal and being able to integrate it with our existing sharepoint sites and being able to provide on-demand reports and searches anything that you can conceive of that you need to automate and integrate you can build within days of receiving the product it was plugged into our virtual environment it's a game changer most of our competition you'll find out is built on old legacy technology we can get you up and running as quickly as possible and yet you'll never outgrow us our software and our technology was built on the latest most innovative technology available today whether you have it on premise and bring it into our hosted environment or take it from our hosted environment and bring it on premise it doesn't matter it's about people at Sharewell it's in the relationships that we build at the end of the meeting he turned to me and he says you guys have got the deal and I said well why what, what made the difference and he says, it's the way Sherwell treated us. We don't get it right every time. We listened, we identified the problem, and then we worked through the solution together. You need to be worried about your legacy. Your legacy is based upon the tools and the people that you employ and how cost effective and what the quality is. So keeping this simple and not expensive and easy to maintain saves you a lot. Hello, my name is Mark Fay from Sharewell Software. We're a proud sponsor of TFT 2014, bringing great ITSM content to the world. Please enjoy this next presentation. Hi, uh, my name is Amy Donahue, and um, I am going to talk a little bit today about technology and a culture of abundance and a little bit about the relationship between technology and culture. So I'm really thrilled to be here and really grateful um, to TFT for the chance to speak and for all the folks who voted for me so I could have a slot and um, be here with you and, and share my ideas and part of what I hope will be a, a longer and broader conversation. So I'm going to share my screen and pull stuff up so you guys can look at what I'm looking at. So bear with me one second here. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the nature of things um, and to um, sort of what are really some fundamental components of our human experience because I think this really informs how our cultures develop and what comes out of our cultures, um, including the technologies we make. So looking at that and then um, looking at the the behaviors that um, make up culture and, and the notion that culture is a pattern and taking a little bit of time to look at our American culture, which is the culture um, I have a perspective on and come from. Um, and then some of the technologies that come out of cultures as cultural responses um, and the most interesting of these being the, the internet and how um, in particular the relationship between the internet as a technology and the behavior of our culture, um, what the relationship between those looks like and um, why that matters for us. And then finishing up looking a little bit at the future of technology and how the relationship between culture and technology inform each other and what that, um, what that means for us uh, later on. 
So in a future where everything is known about you, how do you want that society to treat you? This is a question I've been thinking a lot about um, in terms of what it means um, for the relationship between our, our culture and our technology and the, the trajectory I, I see us on. So we'll come back to this, but um, this is a question that has informed a lot of my thinking, and I, I kind of want to use that to, to frame the discussion. So the nature of things, everything is impermanent, and we really dislike this. Um, we have such a hard time with it as humans, and um, as a result, we turn what matters literally into matter. Um, this is one of the ways in which um, we come to understand the abstract natures of our experience. So we just had Valentine's Day last week, and just take a minute to think whether or not you um, did something to embody a relationship that was important in your life. Maybe you sent a card or um, uh, brought some other token um, in, into the relationship around sort of what that means. So this really abstract thing like a relationship, how, you know, what does that mean? Um, that we like to try and embody that in the physical objects around us because abstraction diminishes intimacy. The most intimate experiences come through our body. They're physical and emotional. They're the sensate experiences that make up, um, that make up how we exist in the world. And so, you know, the really strong feelings of feeling love or anger or fear or joy and the way in which we interact with the physical world around us, that is um, the physicality of that is what creates intimacy and abstraction diminishes that. Um, but what abstraction does do is it increases abundance. So as soon as we remove the physical limits of self, we're able to um, transcend and expand into a more abundant space. So language, as an example, allows us to collaborate and sort of move beyond just that um, single self mode of operation. Money allows us to transmute um, the value of physical objects in a way that we can start manipulating the physical world around us um, through the, the power of abstraction, and that generates a lot of abundance. So in our human experiences, we're constantly toggling back and forth between these two modes of um, experiencing the abstract and then trying to bring that down into a physical form and as we go back and forth between that, one of the things that happens is embodied abstraction, the abstraction we put into the physical ob objects that bear that abstraction, hides the complexity behind it. Um, so the abstraction we use to create physical abundance is really hard for us to remember. And um, we'll just look at a quick example of this. So. Um, Something as simple as, as breakfast, as this bowl of cereal, is actually incredibly complex. And um, there's the earth and the sun and the atmosphere and the rain that grows the grains um, that are used to make up the cereal. And there's a farmer who's kind of um, having, you know, cultivating a lot of that. And if we put milk in the cereal, we need a cow who eats stuff. And there's a whole nother farm and a process and a business around that. So just to get the, the raw materials for this food. And that gets sold and shipped um, to a factory where that gets processed. And there are people working there. And um, working in the factory and running the business and marketing. And then there are other factories who make the packages for this. And there are more people there um, all involved in those businesses. And so we end up with a finished product that gets sold and transported. And there are truckers and there is a petroleum industry, right, all contributing to this. And it ends up um, at a distributor and a grocery store. And there are people working there. and. Um, and, and people like me and you can show up and buy this and uh, bring it home and sit down and have what seems like this really simple bowl of cereal. It maybe takes five minutes to eat. We don't spend a lot of time thinking about it usually. But wrapped up in this is a huge amount of abundance and complexity and thousands of people um, and all these industries that have helped um, bring this to our table. And even more amazing than that is that this only costs us about 40 cents, maybe 50 cents when we add the milk. And um, that's 
astounding. That is really hard for me to get my head around. And um, it is um, it is a pattern that is as old as commerce. Um, it's not new, but we've seen an acceleration because the patterns of our culture are being scaled by technology. So culture is a pattern. Um, and uh, we'll talk a, a little bit about the, the nature of culture. So culture is the collective instinct of a population. Um, humans as animals are really unusual in that we um, we don't have a lot of native instinct. We aren't born knowing how to do very much. We have to learn everything. And um, instinct is, is really valuable. And so um, the way we create that instinct is, is through our culture. So culture is learned and preserved through deep repetition and social reinforcement. It's introduced very early in our lives. Um, it's repeated uh, largely through imitation with some explicit direction. Um, and in that way, because of its um, early introduction and its frequent repetition, it becomes transparent and automatic in the same way instinct is. And this is really valuable, but it also becomes very hard to have perspective on culture from the inside. It's, um, culture is transparent from the inside out. It functions like a one-way mirror. And so, perspective usually comes from outside the pattern. It's one reason why people like to travel so much is it gives them a lens on the patterns that are in the customs that are so automatic to them to be disrupted a little bit in a way that's still comfortable. So American culture, America like all cultures, like all populations has um, its own culture and any population, you know, a family or a nation or a gender um, creates a, a set of cultural instincts around itself. And the dominant American narrative is a personal identity of hope. We have our favorite American narratives um, that are the success stories of the American dream. And they have um, these really iconic stories that go with them that will look really familiar to you as starting from this place of incredible suffering and duress and making progress and making progress and having education be a really big part of what happens in this American narrative and culminating in this um, place of achievement and wealth and success that has sort of trans transcended the really difficult um, and painful roots of our origin. So this is the quintessential classic American narrative. And, and there's a lot of truth in this narrative, which is part of what makes it so easy to hold and so easy to tell. It's a great story. But there are a lot of quiet epilogues to this story that we don't do such a good job talking about and are nevertheless a huge part of um, the culture we live in, but not well addressed by the dominant patterns in our culture. And I really believe we're at a point um, where because of where we are culturally and because of the technology available to us, we can start to push on this um, in a way that hasn't been possible before and can result in a much higher quality of living for a much broader part of our population. So some of the values that go into making up American culture around individualism, optimism, security, control, growth, and display. Um, People, non-native people who came here by and large came because wherever they were um, was not a great place to be. And there was this incredible sense that um, there was a better way to strike out in the world and that um, the power of the individual and the hope of the individual um, could do that and that there would be a way to create more security um, than was available at the start. And one of the ways in which we do that is through this sense of control. Control is an American value that um, we'll look at a little bit more in terms of how it manifests in our technologies and really central to the growth um, that we've seen in this country. And, um, and with that growth, we also like display. It's not quite enough for us to um, just have achievement. We sort of want people to know about our achievement. 
So these are some of the ways, it's certainly not an exhaustive list, but some of the ways in which our collective identity reinforces our individual behaviors, which is a key component of how culture works and um, continues to really create that narrative of moving from a place of suffering to a place of success. And that pain hope cycle is um, what drives astounding feats of achievement. We have achieved a, a, a huge amount of stuff in America um, that is um, that that is incredibly valuable. So looking at technology as not something that sort of happens in its own right or happens independent from a culture, but looking at it as um, a cultural reaction. And so we build our value systems and the value systems held by a culture will um, significantly inform the technologies it produces. And I, I'm using technology in a very broad sense here as anything produced by, um, by a human mind, not just the sort of modern digital technology. So that's certainly a, a big part of what we're talking about. So I want to just look a little bit at some of the technologies that are um, really wrapped up in um, the American cultural narrative and have become um, normalized into our, our cultural narrative as a way to understand kind of where we are today um, in the digital technologies we've created and how we're using them. So finance and science, these are um, certainly much older than American culture. They have a, a long history in Western culture. Double entry ledgers, um, which were introduced in 13th century um, Italy, they are they were this incredible abstraction machine. So suddenly there was a way um, through finance to reconcile the physical inventory of a business and to exchange um, different physical in, it, physical inventories and in, in business in a way that really revolutionized commerce. Um, and science is this no, another incredible abstraction machine. The scientific method is a Western invention. And as soon as we created a framework for replicable results and extrapolatable results and predictable results, we had this amazing way to start um, abstracting what would happen in the future. And um, both of these have really been embraced as technologies in American and culture um, to create this phenomenal abstraction exchange that powers all of the abundance we see. So abstraction is way up, abundance is way up, but um, intimacy is, is going down a little bit, going down a lot. So looking at the American value of control and how this shows up in our technologies and how these have been incorporated into our cultural value system. So birth control has allowed um, a tremendous amount of control over um, over the life force, basically. And um, women, uh, you know, now can participate in the workforce in a very different way that has dramatically shifted how our family structures function, um, how our workplaces function. And that's all a direct result of having much, much more control over our bodies, kind of our most immediate environment. Similarly, uh, control over our energy sources. Um, again, not new technologies. Electricity has been around a long time. Heating has been around a long time, but um, they've um, these technologies have been normalized in a way that gives us this incredible sense of control over our immediate surroundings. And we also see this extended even further out into our ecosystem. So um, with genetically modified crops and the way we produce food, We've created these monocultures of food that um, are very predictable and um, rely on a lot of abstraction to create incredible abundance, right? Food is so much cheaper than it used to be. It's very inexpensive and very reliable because um, of the way we control those crops. So we see control over our, um, over our bodies and our immediate environments and our ecology. And we didn't even stop there that, you know, we really love to be in charge of stuff. So we went into outer space and we've started um, exploring beyond our planet. And we have satellites in space that give us turn by turn directions when we drive. So 
this is um, important to kind of understand part of the, the ethos that makes up the way we think about and use technology and a high degree of control over our bodies and environments has become very normal um, in the way we use technology. Part of the way this has come about is through segmentation, which results in complexity. So again, older patterns here, not anything new with industrialization and the notion that when you want to um, extrapolate um, and you want to have a lot of control over what happens, you break the problem into smaller parts. And so you segment it, but then it needs to be reassembled, which can lead to some complexity. So we see that starting to happen. We see um, our financial systems getting more and more abstract and kind of the transactional nature of um, finance becoming more abstract and more abundant and requiring less human participation. And, and it, as these technologies become incorporated into the way we behave, we see that reflected back to us in the environments we create around them. So workplaces that are very segmented and don't encourage a lot of disruption to the process because that's not helpful um, in scaling abundance. So we end up with very efficient global supply chains where you know your bowl of cereal um, shows up on your table for 40 cents, but there's a lot going on behind it. So segmentation creates efficiency, but it increases complexity. And um, perhaps the best example of this is the internet. We created this amazing tool in the internet that um, keeps us all connected, gives us a tremendous sense of control over the way we live our lives, the way we communicate, when we communicate, when we buy things, when we work. Um, so the internet is a tool that really reflects our cultural values and abundance is way up as a result, but intimacy is down. And as we move into a world where we live but um, more and more in a little bit of an abstraction layer, there's, um, we see a change in our behavior in terms of what that means for um, how we perceive the world and, and how we treat each other. So the internet is a pattern machine. That is basically what we have built with this tool. And what's fascinating about this to me is it's not just reflective of our culture, but it's reflective of the meta structure of our culture. So culture is a pattern machine. The internet is a pattern machine, but it is a pattern machine that runs at a very different speed than our culture. So it scales to failure. The internet scales impermanence. It blows stuff up way faster than we're used to. So we have this really natural, you know, natural law in the way things function. And we've created this wonderful tool that accelerates that in a way our culture is um, not quite caught up to and isn't really prepared for. So the 2008 financial crisis is a great example of what happens when um, technology is not well synced with a culture and when it runs faster than the culture. So there were a lot of factors that contributed to this um, to this crisis, but one of the, the, the dominant contributions was that we built these financial models that um, predicted risk based on data of 30-year fixed mortgages that were part of a, of a very well-established cultural pattern of how lending worked. And then we used the technology to extend those loans to a population that behaved very differently. And that happened at scale. It happened very rapidly um, with a much broader population. And as a result, um, things did not work out the way we had predicted. And this is not an anomaly. We have reached a point where our uh, our systems are too big not to fail. As we bind them up with a scale with scaling technologies, um, we are going to see this happen more and more of the time. And the primary reason for that is we're building new models that use data from usage models that are very different than what the technology allows. So 
big data can only predict the future of the past. And we're at this intersection point where we are starting to use technologies that accelerate our behavior and change our behavior faster than the culture is changing and faster than the culture is prepared to respond to. So this is the world we live in now, where we're in this hyper-connected, hyper-fast environment, and we're just a very, very small part of that, and it's increasingly difficult um, to live in a way that isn't deeply entwined with that. And a question that I think is really important to ask is, when our lives are deeply enmeshed with a system that routinely scales to supernova, what does that mean for our human experience? What does that mean in terms of how we create and use technology in a way that serves us well? So we're in the information age. Information is compressed experience. It takes a huge amount of thinking and effort and validation and it compresses it into a relatively small object. And this is wonderful. This is so much of our our human achievement is predicated on this, right? We literally do not have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to keep doing that. But what happens is um, that that experience is compressed inside the information. So a question I think is really important to start asking in our information and technology design is, is the embedded experience and the information I'm using right for the experience I want to create? in a world where information is ubiquitous and um, we have so much choice around what to use and when to use it, starting to think critically, is the embedded experience in this information right for the experience I want to create? Similarly, design is an embedded and directive value system. So think for a minute about your kitchen and that that kitchen was designed and it might have been designed on a, on a value system that um, really valued the, the, the working experience of the chef. And so there's maybe a nice work triangle and appliances are laid out in a way that really facilitates a pleasurable cooking experience. Or it might have been designed on a value system um, that valued economic efficiency. And so appliances were placed where it was cheapest to put them. And in either case, there is a design under underlying that that's going to direct the person using that kitchen into a specific experience. So asking the question, as we design and use technology, is the embedded value system and the technology I'm using right for the experience I want to create? We have designed the perfect tool for constant engagement and social reinforcement. The internet is a culture replicator and we can try to copy our culture, which is largely what we're doing now with mixed results, or we can intentionally create a new one. We have this um, phenomenal invention and by and large, so far we have only popularized it to determine what we like. And um, I, think we're, I think we're underachieving. We could use some perspective. And um, luckily, we have invented a pattern machine to help us with that. So I want to talk a little bit about you know, where, what the future of technology might look like. Um, based on some of this and based on where we're at. So right now, our technology is predicting the same culture that built it. We're kind of stuck in this closed loop. Sometimes that gets away from us and surprises us, but by and large, um, we're using this tool to predict the same culture that built it and reinforcing the same um, values and patterns that exist in our culture today. So one way which we might start to think about disrupting that is to change the technology and the way we use the technology to encourage reflection rather than replication. So we have this enormous data trail where we're adding to it every second in terms of what we're doing and where we are and what we like and how we're behaving. And we have... Um, an unbelievable opportunity to flip the lens and look at um, what we're doing and our social behaviors um, through a through a through a different perspective. 
and we have um, the data available to do that. Um, and the technology can help us see different data, but it doesn't necessarily help us come to different conclusions or, or, or make different interpretations of that data. So diversity in terms of our value set is going to be really important for exposing um, the the cultural norms that are very hard for us to see that are transparent because we live inside them. So thinking about as we design technology and use technology, um, asking what are the values we want addressed through this and really expanding our diversity to account for different value systems and true diversity doesn't just look different, it sounds different than what we're used to. And being willing to um, to listen to that and, and, and look at that as something that potentially is really beneficial to embrace. So another way in which we might approach um, technology that serves us well in the future is to start thinking about how do we design values instead of objects, instead of products, discrete products or discrete, discrete services, what does it mean to plan for the values that serve a caring humanity, serving a sentient planet? and to design technology that mutates or eliminates itself in service to those values. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but I think it's a fascinating question to start thinking about and start discussing of what does value-based technology look like rather than designing for discrete outcomes. And we can start to expand the values we put in the replicator. So we have this culture replicator that we're going to respond to that's going to push on our behaviors. And rather than feeding it the same things that exist today, we can think about in what ways do we want to expand what we're putting in to the replicator. So service, for example, who will our technology serve? Right? Service can look like this. Or service can look like this. Who do we want to serve and how do we want to serve them? Design is a directive value system. Conflict is a part of any culture. And we can ask, what model do we want copied? What do we want to put into the replicator and have imitated? Do we want conflict to look like this? Is this what we want seen? Is this what we want imitated? Do we want conflict to look like this? Do we want it to look like something different still? Information is compressed experience. Or asking even, what does abundance look like? Um, what do we want more of right now? Culturally, abundance looks like this, but it could look like this. And so that knowing that the internet is going to reinforce our value system and starting to think about designing the culture we want um, in the future we are creating. So coming back to this question, in a future where everything is known about you, how do you want that society to treat you? And we can, we can approach this question from a technological standpoint around how do we continue to protect our privacy in the digital age, or we can approach it from a cultural standpoint and ask instead, um, you know, what is a, cult a viable cultural reaction to this, um, which might be something like, um, choosing as a culture to eliminate shame and the devastating consequences that go along with shame and using our technology to create that culture um, instead of one that um, values privacy because of the importance of privacy where there's a lot of fear inside the culture. So what kind of culture um, do you want to feed the pattern machine and how do we want to think about using our technology to do that. So this is the end of my slides um, for the second time. <laughs> But that, you know, this time I did with you with me. So I'm going to hop um, out of the um, my big display here and um, just look really quickly to see if there are any questions. I've got a couple minutes and I'll try and um, take them. So. All right, so I have a question here. It says, um, is fear in cultures everything that have a negative effect on values? Um, it's a little tricky to not go back and 
forth with the audience, but I'm going to take my best guess at what you're asking here. And my apologies if I get it wrong. Um, I think fear certainly can have a negative effect um, in what happens within a culture. Um, and but you know, fear drives a lot of good things too. For me, you know, looking at any particular value isn't is this a positive or negative value uh, so much as what are the consequences of this value and which consequences um, do we want to continue to reinforce? And sometimes, you know, fear has a lot of energy in it and can be really useful. And sometimes it's really damaging, um, but that's often based on the context. So let me um, just look quickly here at what else is in the list. Bear with me one second. So, okay, so here's one that's asking, how do we design for values? Um, by exposing our values as examples of those um, values we want for, um, for our loved ones. So it's a great question. How do we design for our values? Um, and I, I think, you know, the other piece you added here is, um, is certainly a component of it. You know, for me, this is, um, I'm, a lot of what I spoke about today just comes from um, my personal experience and um, looking at my own values really critically and spending a lot of time and reflection around those values has been a really important part of that. Um, I'm a writer and I blog and I think a lot about technology and how it um, interacts with our humanity. So uh, I believe it's certainly my personal experience has borne out that it absolutely starts um, in a very small way with oneself um, and thinking about and getting clarity around what what do I value and what matters to me and then how do I want to, to bring that value into the world and um, that usually starts in a really small way. And um, one of the things that's so fantastic about the connective and scaling power of the internet is um, we can start scaling really small things. And sometimes that works out great and sometimes that works out not so great. So I think the notion of um, awareness around what we're doing has um, become much, much more important than it ever was before. So um, I believe I'm just about at time and I want to um, make sure that I don't run over. So thank you so much um, for your questions and um, for listening and for giving me a chance to share a little bit of what's on my mind. And um, it's been great to be with you here today. Thank you very much.